Good evening, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you this evening. Um, my topic being on precision medicine and paediatric neurology, current status and future perspectives. This is a very exciting time for those of us who work in new paediatric neurology in view of the number of changes that are moving forward and the real prospect of improving outcomes of our patients. There's probably far too much to go over in the spate of the lecture and time of the lecture this, after, this evening, but um, I hope that I can give you an overview about where we sit. So these are my disclosures. So if we think about neurological disease in childhood, around a third of hospitalized pediatric patients do have a neurological problem, and this causes significant long-term morb morbidity. Traditionally within pediatric neurology, our rate of diagnosis with regard to underlying cause has been traditionally low. And many of us have been involved during our time in symptomatic rather than curative management. <clears throat> that is, we have really moved forward over time. We traditionally as pediatric neurologists have been good delineating phenotypes, utilizing clinical examination on which to base patterns of diagnosis and therefore ultimately come to clinical diagnoses. But with the advances in basic science and utilization of natural history and cohort studies, we've been able to delineate underlying causes in many of the diseases we treat, both from a genetic and imaging point of view, and also look at biomarkers of disease, which we can then follow. And we've been therefore able to unlock um, the codes towards treatment, to, to, towards treatment of the underlying causes, as opposed to the symptomatic treatment, thereby having a benefit or a ch changing the natural history of the disease. So before we go on, maybe we need to look at what is indeed precision medicine, the application of emergent technologies to better manage patients' health, and to target therapies to achieve the best outcomes in the management of a patient's disease or predisposition, predisposition to disease. Certainly, if we look epidemiologically, we've determined um, on, a, on a population basis aspects of prediction of disease and looking at targeted prevention of disease. But when it comes down to rare disease, then we want the early identification of the disease, having a precise diagnosis, and thereafter targeted interventions so that we may be able to in the longer term improve outcomes. And what Keo illustrated here in this um, diagram, that ultimately, even in rare disease, there may be greater efficiency from streamlined care pathways and ultimately going to the right treatment and indeed better outcomes. So if we return to childhood neurological disease, by carefully delineating the phenotypes, as we have long done since the start of pediatric neurological practice, we have gained insights into the underlying cause and ultimately, through predominantly genetics, the underlying mechanisms responsible for the disease. From that, we've been able to look at more targeted treatments, thereby precision medicine, and then cha thereafter changing perhaps the natural histories of the conditions. So we've really moved from symptomatic to interventional treatments and therefore have a real possibility of improving outcomes. In the first instance, we've gained new insights into some neurological diseases through the determination that autoimmune disease may be responsible for certain um, uh, neurological presentations. This is still an evolution in the fact that we, we have certain patterns of uh, presentation, not least acute encephalopathies in previously normal in children that may be the result of antibody production to um, uh, surface membrane anti um, antigens. But also we know that, that, that and sometimes we may see changes in antibodies to these antigens in neurological disease that aren't necessarily directly the cause. So the difficulty has always been at what point can we target treatment towards an autoimmune encephalopathy utilizing immunosuppressive agents. This is still an evolution, but certainly we have care pathways, algorithms that help us with regard to this. 
and certainly utilizing steroids earlier rather than later and have real decision making trees about whether to utilize more aggressive therapy. This, of course, can be looked at as a precision medicine because we're targeting the underlying cause. And diseases or Ill, um, patterns of abnormality that we may be used to that have been historically the mainstay of what we do, for example, cerebral palsy. We've known specific risk factors with the development in children of cerebral palsy or indeed movement disorder, not least prematurity and hypoxic ischemic um, uh, encephalopathy, placental insufficiency. But now we are aware that up to 30% of such cases may be genetic in nature. And this, of course, may change how we move forward um, as it implicates new therapeutic targets. Neurometabolic disease is another area where we've really moved forward towards targeting the underlying cause. Perhaps the best example in CLN2 type, um, type 2, uh, CLN2 Batten disease or neurolipofuscinosis. This where the gene encodes for an enzyme, lysosome serial peptidase, and it's actually um, replenishment and um, certainly, first of all, in, um, we've seen the natural history. This was mapped out in determining that actually many begin to show deterioration around the age of two years with a rapid um, uh, fall off after that with seizures, ataxia, language and motor loss, dementia, blindness and early death. And much before we determine the underlying cause and certainly a new therapy, the standard of care was supportive or indeed palliative um, with death towards between five and 10 years of age. However, utilizing um, serolipoprotease alpha through an ICV infusion, there's been a real change in the natural history. As you can see on the left, those treated um, with serolipoprotease alpha, um, uh, the change in motor and language score virtually non-existent as opposed to what would be seen in historical controls over time. And again, the total score, which made up of all the different um, clinical features, no real change compared to historical controls. Acknowledging there needs to be repetitive infusion um, on a, a regular basis, but that said, these children are um, stabilizing and not showing the st steady deterioration that was previously seen without treatment. And this is not the only um, neurometabolic disease, neurodegenerative disease, for which we're now beginning to see targeted therapies. You can see in many different um, diseases where we first found the underlying cause and subsequently, but whether it be through genetic therapy or indeed enzyme replacement therapy, there is real possibility of treatment in many of these diseases. But it's actually in neuromuscular disease where the real breakthrough came and where we determined that actually genetic therapy may have a real benefit in um, children with neurological disease. Spinal muscular atrophy, um, the result of a homozygous mutation in the SNM, SMN1 gene, um, but there is at least the retention of one copy gene, Paralog SMN2. And if there's upregulation of the remaining um, uh, normal gene, then actually this may um, resolve function. Typically, with SMA1, for example, the diagnosis is devastating. The natural history, again, natural history studies being undertaken to determine what might be expected without treatment, median time to death or permanent ventilation being between six and 10 months. However, utilizing ASO technology and therefore enhancing um, the SNMN2 um, protein, then utilizing this through um, uh, ICV um, injection, you can see that actually um, the scores, the motor scores over time are substantially improved in the treated group. And indeed, clinically, a completely different natural history that's seen um, uh, um, over time to what would have been seen traditionally with SMA1 untreated. So then my specialty, of course, is the epilepsies. 
And never in my lifetime did I think I'd be talking about precision therapy in the epilepsis. If we look at what we traditionally treat epilepsy with, a symptom, an epileptic seizure being a symptom of many, many different causes, our anti, um, anti epileptics or anti seizure medications have been quite generic. They've been targeted at reducing excitability. And there have been many new anti epileptic drugs seen over particularly the past 30 years come onto the market. That said, in two identical studies performed 30 years apart, there was little change in the proportion that were drug resistant over time, remaining at around 30% although there was a change in the type or perhaps the actual medication used with the newer anti-epileptic drugs being utilized more recently. The whole question is, are our patients better? Are they e the anti-epileptic drugs now on the market easier to use? Do they have less adverse effects? Or are they really any better with regard to the efficacy against seizures? Although many of our anti-epileptic drugs have been targeted at um, hyperexcitability, reducing excitability of neurons, many of those drugs that we have now available have been found by accident to be anti-epileptic or anticonvulsant in their properties. And it's only subsequently that in vitro studies have shown what their mechanism of action may be. But as highlighted um, <coughs> just Epilepsy isn't a single diagnosis. It may be, it, it, what it is, is the propensity to have recurrent epileptic seizures, but actually it's a symptom. And we have to think of the concept that it's a symptom of many different diseases rather than a disease on its own. And with the advent of initially neuroimaging and now of course the genetic um, evolution, we've been able to um, determine a lot of um, genetic variants to be responsible for many, particularly of the early onset epilepsis. And by understanding which gene mutations or variants um, are, are responsible, we've been able to surmise the pathways for which these um, code for, and therefore think about what, how we may move forward with targeted therapy. And if we look at the new framework of the epilepsies, um, thinking about the seizure types, the epilepsy types, and the electroclinical syndromes is still there, but increasing the etiology is it, it um, needs to be reviewed and is responsible for the type of epilepsy that we will see. And of course, the comorbidities that are so integral to the diagnosis are part of that, and of course, need to be thought about when we're looking at outcomes. Surgery, of course, may be thought of as a targeted therapy, as it targets a localized area of abnormality or malformation. We find an abnormality, perhaps on the MRI scan, that's consistent with the seizure semiology and or the EEG. And we know with early surgery um, that in the long term, there's a really good chance of seizure cure in carefully selected individuals, not least from the randomized controlled trial um, that was performed um, uh, here in, Indi in India, um, showing that at 12 months, there's significantly more children seizure-free in the surgical group than the medical therapy group. And we also know, know that if we perform surgery at an appropriate time, in the longer term, there's a really good chance of improving cognitive outcome highly associated with seizure freedom and indeed um, coming off medication. We've also long been used to treating um, some of the early onset epilepsies appropriately with um, uh, supplements or particularly looking at cofactors of particular enzymes that form metabolic disease, not least the vitamins. And the most um, classic form of that is, of course, vitamin B6 responsive ep epilepsies for when, what we now know, um, the genetic mutation and that it's really an antiquitin deficiency, but certainly long time use of B6 or indeed pyridoxal phosphate in these individuals um, reduces seizures and improves outcomes. And the ketogenic diet, a treatment about which we've known for a very long time, a high fat, low carbohydrate diet that's been demonstrated in drug resistant epilepsies to um, be beneficial um, over and above no change in treatment and several randomized controlled trials now demonstrating that. 
but there are metabolic defects for which the glu uh, ketogenic diet is the treatment of choice because it's a targeted therapy. Glucose transporter defects, for example, where the ketones bypass the problem, bypass the glucose transporter, for which there is a problem, and provides a fuel to the brain. And we know that the epilepsies in association with this are highly likely to be responsive. Although it's not the whole story, and there are other postulations, and not least about the fact there's a role in structural epilepsies, where there's a particular response to epilepsy associated with malformations of cortical development, or indeed that the result of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And where we know that initial treatment may lead to a dramatic improvement that's not seen to um, reverse on coming off the ketogenic diet in time, the postulation that this is related to um, uh, methylation properties, namely methylation of DNA leading to inactive um, genes resulting in the epileptogenesis. And by reversing that, the result of the ketogenic diet leading to improvement and seizure control. But of course, it's in the genetic epilepsies where there's been most promise and to what we, where we look at um, with regards to moving forward. And there's been an explosion again about finding single gene abnormalities in um, certain, particularly the early onset epilepsies, with more of the abnormalities being found the harder you look, namely the, the greater extent of the testing. And more likely to be an abnormality if the children um, are young when they start with their epilepsy, and if they have associated comorbidities, not least developmental problems. And this um, showing the promise of targeted therapy. This, the results of the uh, Scottish study where they looked at all children and presenting under the age of three years with new onset epilepsy and performing a gene panel where they found a range of underlying genetic defects. And those highlighted in black are those for which there is the real promise of targeted therapy. And in our own series, um, in the uh, children recruited under the age of one year, again showing similar um, uh, genetic abnormalities, although in different prevalence. So over the next few slides, I'd like to illustrate how we've moved forward with regard to targeting um, those gene defects and indeed the pathways for which they are responsible to try and determine whether we can gain a better degree of seizure control. And of course, the TSC1 and TSC2 gene responsible for tuberous sclerosis um, as part of um, the Gator complex, certainly as one area where, of course, there's been a lot of promise. Tuberous sclerosis, classically a clinical diagnosis, we now know the result of TSC1 or TSC2 mutations in the mTOR pathway. But with mTOR um, inhibition, in this case, utilizing Everolimus, although other mTOR inhibitors have been demonstrated to have a similar benefit, this and RCT in epilepsy, the associated with um, tuberous sclerosis, showing a benefit in seizures um, at three months. And in what's tantalizing here is there's steady improvement in seizures over time, suggesting perhaps there may be a degree of disease mod modification. In children, there may be a slightly greater response than you might see in older children. And showing that it's not isolated to perhaps Everolimus or something that may be relatively expensive. This is a study published by my colleague, Finbora Callahan, who looked at metformin, another mTOR inhibitor, but of course a much more widely utilized medication in tuberous sclerosis, their primary outcome being a reduction in size of renal um, AMLs, but of course they didn't actually show, demonstrate a change in them, but they did demonstrate a change in size of seizures and also demonstrated a benefit in those with epilepsy in the metformin group versus the placebo group. And of course, TSC1 and TSC2 genes are not the only genes in the mTOR pathway. There are other genes that may um, also be targeted, may be associated with structural brain abnormalities as a cause of epilepsy. And here, diet looking at exome sequencing and non-acquired focal epilepsy, finding a range of different mutations, not least a significant number in the Gator complex. KCNQ2 and KCNT1 mutations have also been of great interest. KCNT1 mutations, gain of function mutations responsible for early epilepsy 
epilepsy in infancy with migrating focal seizures. A de particularly devastating um, epilepsy occurring the first year of life with subsequently very little in the way of developmental progress. Kinidine has been demonstrated in vitro to reverse the gain of function seen in the KCNT1 mutation. And although initially trialled in one case reported by Bearden and colleagues with promise, there's probably been a favourable response seen in about 12 out of 25 patients in the literature. KCNT1 mutations may also be responsible for autosomal dominant frontal lobe epilepsy. But in a crossover trial in adults, um, they showed no um, benefit to the seizures in a single family. And indeed, what makes it more complicated is that there isn't a consistency to, of response, even though many show gain of function mutations. And my colleague, Amy McTague, showed that many of the KCNT1 variants seen um, in the early onset epilepsies result, were the result of a marked gain, resulted in a marked gain of function with in, significantly increased channel amplitude but they were variably blocked by kinidine, probably explaining why not all children appear to um, respond and therefore it's not so straightforward. KCNQ2 mutations were originally known to be associated with benign familial neonatal seizures and therefore as there was spontaneous remission, a question as to why we would need to worry about possible treatment. But it became increasingly recognised that it was a cause of mutations in this gene could cause a more severe neonatal onset epilepsy with ongoing seizures and poor neurodevelopmental outcome. We did have a potassium channel modulator, ritagabin. And in fact, when it was available, it was shown that in, with, particularly if used early, it could have an effect on the epilepsies and improve um, outcome. However, what's also been demonstrated is the marked sensitivity of this group to sodium channel blockers. And indeed, outcomes that we're seeing at the present time, if these are utilized early, traditionally not so, but if these are utilized early, then better um, outcomes are being seen. And this isn't the only um, abnormality that may be responsive to sodium channel blockers. Gain of function mutations in SCN8A genes and also the NCN2A gene may um, uh, show um, a marked benefit, the result of sodium uh, utilization of sodium channel blockers. Again, targeting the underlying cause, having a bit more understanding about what we're treating. And increasingly, as more mutations are determined, although this is only a drop in the ocean compared to the number of mutations that have been reported, but certainly increasingly, we're being able to have an understanding of the underlying pathways responsible um, as a cause of the change in mutations and thereafter more targeted therapies um, aimed at those underlying mutations and pathways. But it's not that straightforward. And I've already mentioned that with regard to the KCNT1 mutations. But in SCN2A mutations, I've just mentioned that many of them are gain of function mutations, especially when they've started in the early part of the first year of life. But there is another group who presents slightly later with the onset of their epilepsy. And indeed, they've been determined to have loss of function mutations. So of course, will not respond to sodium channel blockers, may even be aggravated by such. So it's important to determine the mutation and to know what suggests whether it's gain or loss of function in order to know how your targeted therapy may work. And thereafter, I hear everyone say so many um, different mutations, so many different um, uh, pathways to look at. Of course, and even then, when we find one particular treatment for a specific mutation, the epilepsy itself may be relative, or the disease itself may be relatively rare. And standard RCT methodology is often going to be impractical. We also need to consider not only where the patients are, how we're going to look at their natural history, and have we had an impact on their natural history, not least looking at different um, designs of trial and ultimately what outcomes we're going to look at, particularly looking at clinically relevant outcomes. As traditionally, we've looked at seizure outcomes, but of course in so many of these children, it's actually looking at their neurodevelopmental outcome and behavior outcomes that are equally important. And perhaps we should be looking at a composite endpoint 
as has been advocated by Rima Nabu and colleagues, where they utilized the Delphi process to see what was important to both families and of course um, professionals. Yes, seizures are there, but actually communication is key as well as activity participation in day-to-day -day life as, and also social functioning. That said, there are other methods being looked at as to how we can determine what we may target with what we may target. This is one approach, um, modeling a particular gene mutation known to be pathogenic in a girl who presented with a typical scn 8 a encephalopathy. But they modeled the mutation in vitro and then applied different um, known um, medications to look for at repurposing medications to see what indeed the that the um, gene um, would have reduced excitability to. And yes, carbamazepine was there as the top medication. She's indeed been seizure free since this medication was trialed. But also other interesting compounds such as amitriptyline, which of course we wouldn't actually think of in the treatment of epilepsy. Another exciting point is that this is my, the next couple of slides are courtesy of my colleague, Amy McTague. Looking at iPSCs, um, cultivated cells um, from skin fibro fibroblasts in specific mutations, growing um, organoids in a petri dish, and perhaps looking at cerebral organoids. In order, these have been utilized um, in a variety of different diseases to try and get a better understanding of treatments that may be effective. And certainly, this is something that AIM is looking at with regard to KCNT1 mutations to see whether we can have a better idea about what treatments may be effective um, in patients. But finally, we started with genetic therapy, not least in neuromuscular disease. Where are we in the epilepsies? And again, I never thought I'd be stood talking about possible genetic therapies in the epilepsies, but this has become a real possibility because of our understanding of the different mutations and indeed, um, uh, looking at animal models and ways forward with regard to gene therapy. And there are several areas where we may move forward of increasing our precision therapy. Not least delineating the minimal circuit for seizures, for example, in interneurons in SCN1A disease. Defining the effective time window for each gene and therefore looking at developmental critical time periods for actually um, uh, uh, enhancing um, the protein product or indeed um, suppressing the gene problem. And there are also etiologically independent gene therapies that are being looked at that may, may be more applicable perhaps to the older individual with no known genetic defect. SCN8A encephalopathy, we've talked about this, usually again a function mutation, but it has a um, slightly later onset than other encephalopathies, but development of multiple seizure types, the movement disorder is common and often has a focal or multifocal EEG. But indeed, there have been novel ch um, sodium channel modulated data is targeted and shown to have an effective treatment in the mouse model of an SCN8A encephalopathy. And also the discovery of the role of fibroblast growth factors, FGF12 um, being and sitting on the membrane and close to the tail of the sodium channel. And therefore modulating this could indeed have an effect on the function of the sodium channel. And this is what's been trialed using utilizing FGF14, demonstrating um, a benefit in a mouse model. Moving on to look at true genetic therapy, this utilizing antisense oligonucleotides to utilizing Tango technology, targeted augmentation of nuclear gene output, identifying ISOs that specifically increase the expression of the productive SCM1A transcript in human cell lines as well as mouse brain. And there's two charts showing firstly, um, uh, not only that you can increase the, um, the, the protein transcript, the haplowance and, and reduce the haplowance efficiency, to increase the sodium channel protein by injecting at um, P2 in a, in a mouse model in, but through an intracerebral ventricular route, but also a single injection at P14, which is a much older mouse, um, demonstrating a similar benefit. 
and also the chart on the right showing that actually this increased transcript is present throughout life um, with them sacrificing the, the mice at different ages. But then also moving forward with a single injection demonstrating both early single injection and later single injection showing um, uh, the, the reduction of SUDAP in these animals as well as showing um, uh, uh, an attenuation of febrile seizures or indeed a longer latency to, um, to their first seizure um, in a mouse model. And another genetic therapy in here using, uh, utilizing Cas9, CRISPR-Cas9 um, technology and utilizing an AAV vector um, to um, introduce into the mouse model. But certainly firstly demonstrating that um, Cas9 mediated SCM1A gene activation can rescue haploinsufficiency in a, in a mouse model, but then also showing um, uh, activation of um, uh, interneuron uh, activity um, in, a, um, uh, in vitro, but ultimately also in utilizing the AAV vector um, with an ICV injection showing um, reduced excitability and indeed attenuation of febrile seizures. And ultimately, more non-specific um, gene therapy for focal epilepsy as illustrated by this paper, where they actually um, utilized a um, plasmid with um, an optimized sequence for encoding glutamate that would um, release on activation showing that this could also be utilized in a mouse model, showing um, reduction in um, uh, excitability and indeed seizure frequency after pilocarpine induction. So where are we now? We have moved on enormously in pediatric neurology, in many of our neurometabolic, in our understanding of underlying cause, in many of our diseases, whether it be acute encephalopathy or um, uh, chronic encephalopathy or indeed neuromuscular disease. By rapid diagnosis, we've been able to look at what the underlying cause is, move towards targeted treatment. And as we move forward in many more diseases than we've been investigating to date, we really hope that we'll be able to improve outcomes in the long term. We really are moving towards personalized medicine as opposed to precision medicine and improving, hopefully, the outcome in the children we treat. Traditionally, we've looked at the phenotype and from there, we've been able to determine the genotype or the gene um, abnormality responsible for the underlying disease. Traditionally, our treatment has been targeted at the phenotype, but now our treatment very much is targeted at the genotype and the discovery of the gene pathways. A problem can never be solved on the same level of thinking that identified it. Wouldn't our forebearers be very so surprised at how far we've come over the past 20 years? Thank you.